Okay, good evening. Can you hear me fine? Yes. yes, am I coming through the microphone? Good, the uh, speaker system? Good. Uh, good evening, my name is Bruce Ferry. I'm a faculty member here at Vanderbilt University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this alternative presidential candidates debate. It's really more of a forum, I suppose. This event was open to participation by all third party candidates for president of the United States, as well as to the major party nominees. I'd like to very quickly acknowledge and thank the organizers of this debate. First, three groups, the National Peace Coalition, uh, secondly, the Coalition for October Debate Alternatives, and thirdly, Vanderbilt Students of Nonviolence. I also want to thank a few key individuals who were instrumental in making this happen, Chris Lugo, Eric Schechter, James Hussain, Elizabeth Barger, Jeannie Thomas, and Cynthia McCarver. Please join me in thanking them. is being um, recorded uh, by Vanderbilt's news service for archiving for later online viewing, um, presumably at Vanderbilt's uh, YouTube page. Um, the format for this event is as follows. Each candidate in a, in a prescribed order, which will actually be from closest to me to furthest away in that order, which is the order in which they uh, actually accepted the invitation to participate, uh, will we'll start with an opening statement of two minutes per candidate. I will then ask a series of questions on policies and issues. I will designate some of these questions as two-minute questions and some of them as one-minute questions for each answer. Uh, we'll try and get as many of them in as we can. We have a timekeeper down front who will uh, uh, show them signs that says stop talking or something to that effect. Um, we will, uh, because they have to pass a microphone down the table, we'll always go in the same ordered direction, but the starting point will be different for each question, so it won't always be the same candidate starting uh, to answer. Um, and then shortly before our time is up, um, I'll move to closing statements, and they'll each have one minute uh, for closing remarks. I know these are really short times to speak, but with so many candidates, and we'd like to hit a lot of issues. Um, as I say, the order of opening statements is as seated. Following the debate, there's going to be a, a reception outside to which uh, everyone is invited. Let me just quickly tell you who the candidates are that we have on hand. Delighted to be here. Closest to me is Charles Jay, who's the pre uh, presidential candidate of the Boston Tea Party. It was founded in 2006 as a sort of a splinter from the U.S. Libertarian Party. Mr. Jay is their first presidential candidate. To his left is Bradford Little, the presidential candidate of the United States Pacifist Party. Mr. Little himself founded that party in the early 1980s and has been his president, its presidential candidate on at least three prior occasions. To his left is Frank uh, McAnulty, who is the presidential candidate of the New American Independent Party. Um, he has various money mates in different states. He's also the vice presidential candidate of the Reform Party and is focusing his NAIC bid on states where there is no Reform Party ballot access. This party, the uh, New American Independent Party, was founded in 2004. He's their first presidential candidate. To his left, fourth from me, is Mr. Brian Moore of the Socialist Party USA. Stuart Alexander is his vice presidential running mate. Uh, the Socialist Party USA is, as I understand it, one of three organizations that emerged from a split of the Socialist Party of America back in the 1970s. The Constitution Party is represented second to last uh, by Daryl Castle, who is its vice presidential candidate. Their presidential candidate, Chuck Baldwin, was unable to make it today, but Daryl Castle, who uh, lives in Germantown, Tennessee, is here. Uh, the Constitution Party actually was originally formed in the early 90s as the U.S. Taxpayers Party and changed its name in 2000. Um, they're on 36 ballots, last time I checked uh, in this election. Um, and last, all the way to the left, is Gloria Lariva, the Party of Socialism and Liberation. Uh, Eugene Perrier is the vice presidential uh, running mate for Ms. Lariva. Uh, this party was formed in the summer of 2004. And so let's welcome them all. We'll move straight to two minute opening statements, starting with Mr. Jay to my immediate left. Hi, I'm Charles Jay from the Boston Tea Party. Yes, we are the Boston Tea Party. And I know that a lot of people uh, smile and sometimes snicker when they hear that name. And um, it, 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 uh, it counts for some very interesting uh, incidents along the campaign trail. I remember when I was in uh, Florida and trying to sign up electors uh, for, to qualify for the ballot. Uh, I was sitting in a friend's office, and, and we must register voters with our party in order for them to qualify. And, uh, 
And uh, after I registered him, he turned to someone that worked in his office and he said, uh, hey, you want to join the Boston Tea Party? And the guy looked at him for a minute and he said, the Boston Tea Party? Didn't that thing happen already? <laughs> I'm here to tell you it's still happening. Uh, the Boston Tea Party advocates the reduction in the size, scope, and power of government on all levels and for all purposes. And you know, you're going to hear a lot about you know, what my perspective is on government throughout the debate. Uh, but what I really want to take an opportunity uh, to do uh, in the opening statement is to thank everybody up here for showing up. Because uh, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with third party politics, but what these uh, people have to do to uh, get through a campaign and to execute the various parts of a campaign really need to be uh, appreciated. These are people not like uh, uh, Obama and McCain who uh, held me up on the highway today, so I got here uh, just about a minute before this thing began, uh, and, and those people basically get subsidized for campaigning. These people take a lot of time and effort to do this, and um, I know that they get asked and I get asked many, many times, why are you running? Well, when you've been through this long enough, the question isn't why are you running? The question is why not? And I think you're going to learn a little bit about that tonight when you listen to everybody up here. So thank you and enjoy the debate. Bradford Little of the United States Pastors Party. My name is Bradford Little. I'm of the United States Pastors Party. It's a great uh, privilege to be down here at, uh, in Tennessee and Nashville. Or, Vanderbilt University, and I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, the Pacifist Party is, uh, it has a religious foundation, as you can imagine. The uh, Mennonite, Quaker, Brethren churches, the traditional Pacifist churches, their principles are behind this. Simply the religious observation that military force is contrary to the principles of the Christian religion, primarily the Sermon on the Mount. But what makes the Pacifist Party distinctive, it is beyond that, it has a scientific foundation. And I'm talking now not about soft science like uh, sociology and history, I'm talking about hard science. I'm talking about mathematical probability analysis. I'm talking about mathematical modeling, which can demonstrate irrefutably that the military policies of the United States and all countries which have nuclear weapons are going to lead to nuclear war, to catastrophic accidents uh, with nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Uh, because of this, the Pacifist Party advocates, first of all, the complete abolition of nuclear weapons. Beyond that, zero military budget. The creation of a defense policy based upon nonviolent resistance, the principles as established by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and others. And then to take all of this money that we save from abolishing the military and use it to overcome the effects of poverty, not only in this country, but worldwide. That is establish complete medical care for every citizen in this country and throughout the world, housing for everyone, education for everyone, everything that people really need. Zero military budget, defense by nonviolent resistance, and using these resources to <coughs> overcome these terrible human problems that we have. Thank you. This is uh, uh, Mr. McAnulty of the New American Independent Party. Hi, I'm Frank McAnulty, and I'm very pleased to be here and really want to thank the people who put this on because the biggest problem as an independent candidate is getting anyone to notice and get some press. They're so behind. They're so involved, invested in the two major parties that the, the, the independents really have an uphill battle no matter what we do. I'm basically, I'm just a regular American. I'm like probably everybody in this room. I have a job, I have a mortgage, I have a wife. We've been married almost 20 years. I have two daughters in high school. So, you know, that's bigger, almost a bigger problem than financial problem sometimes, but. And the reason I started running for president was because I was just totally fed up and disgusted with the fact that the two major political parties really <clears throat> seem to ignore the vast majority of Americans, what I consider to be the, the moderate majority. You've got the, in some ways you've got the far right, you've got the far left, and then there's the wide swath in the middle that no one pays attention to. You know, 
Lately, I've seen studies that show that there's more independents registered in this country now than there are Republicans and Democrats. And that says something. And so the key is, how do we get those people together? How do we get the vast moderate majority together to work together? It's always a problem. But I think it can be done through events like this and through you know, us meeting each other and talking to each other because we do have a lot of things in common with each other. And that is, we want the country to run better. We want to leave a better country for our children and grandchildren. I'm appalled at what I think I'm going to leave to my two daughters. And I think a lot of people are. And I'm also very concerned with people just being able to make a living and survive day to day you know, with gas prices and health insurance and everything else. And that's what we need to address without the special interests and without all the big money moving the debate in directions that they want it rather than the direction the American people want it. Thank you. Next is Brian Moore, Socialist Party USA. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, also express my disappointment that Mr. Na Mr. Nader, Ms. McKinney, and Mr. Barr are not here tonight with us. I think it's hypocritical if they complain about not being able to debate with the two major party candidates, but then can't participate with us just because we're not, uh, have a, a lot of uh, states on the ballot. We're not on the ballot in a lot of states. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about my personal uh, experiences and education, and then when we get into the questions, I'll tell you about the Socialist Party. I was born and raised in Oakland, California. I'm one of seven children. Uh, I was basically an Irish Catholic uh, upbringing, Catholic schools. Uh, and then I went into the Franciscan Seminary for five years, the, the Missions of California, which was an order dedicated to serving the poor. I came home and uh, took a year of graduate school at California State University in political science and then got a master's degree in Arizona State University in public administration. I went into the Peace Corps for three years in Latin America, trained in Puerto Rico, and then served in Panama and Peru, and was exposed to left-wing military governments, and saw Salvador Allende make his first speech as a democratically elected socialist in the country of Chile. Uh, I'm an anti-war activist, a civic activist. I oppose the Vietnam War, opposed the Iraq and Afghanistan involvement. And I've been involved in the inner cities throughout the United States. Uh, I uh, also uh, got involved with uh, working for other politicians throughout the country and then ran myself in Washington, D.C. for council and mayor against Mayor Barry and here in, and in Florida for Congress and the U.S. Senate. I was endorsed by Ralph Nader and the Green Party as an independent candidate. And then I took a trip to Cuba when I could not participate in the debates in Florida with Ms. Uh, Catherine Harris or Senator Nelson. And I was able to speak freely in Cuba and have a press conference there. Oh, sorry, uh, Daryl Castle of the Constitution Party. Uh, the the Constitution Party derives its name, obviously, from the U.S. Constitution. And uh, the Constitution is the charter of this nation. And it is what it says it is in Article 6, Paragraph 2, the supreme law of the land. And it's our contention that this country faces many problems today. Many of them are life-threatening to the nation. And most of them could be solved if we would just return to the Constitution. We didn't get where we are today because our government is too obedient to the Constitution or because it's too slavish in its following of the rule of law or because it is too decentralized or because it has respected the sovereignty of the individual states to too large an extent uh, or because it refuses to use military force and brutality instead of diplomacy. No, just the opposite is true. And so uh, the Constitution Party calls for a return to constitutional government, a return to a respect for the rule of law, and a return to uh, economic sanity, and a refusal to 
provide hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money to people essentially to cover their gambling debts, which have gone bad. Uh, we stand for all those things. We favor a non-interventionist foreign policy, uh, and we uh, are opposed to our participation in the Mideast war now, and we would call for an immediate military withdrawal from the Middle East. Those are some of the things that we stand for, but primarily we stand for constitutional government and respect for the rule of law. Thank you. achieve that status, uh, the Democrats and Republicans are on automatically across the country. And there's a reason. It's because the two parties of capitalism, of imperialism, make sure to control the system so that the rich stay in power and the rest of us work and get exploited. We are for socialism, and that is a system in which all the wealth that the working class produces belongs collectively as a whole to the people, and therefore that all benefits, the needs of the people are met because profits are not the motive. We're just for the elimination of private property, and that's the real way to guarantee, for example, housing for everybody. That housing should not be a commodity to be speculated and split and then taken from you when you can't pay the increase in mortgage rates, but instead that it's given to you as a right, and the right to a job. I'm for a constitution, but for a new constitution. A constitution that codifies the right to a job, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to freedom from racism, sexism, and, and, and homophobia, the right for every individual to have rights as a human being. And I'm from New Mexico. I was born in Albuquerque. I went to college at Brandeis University in 1972, and I walked into that school because African American and Latino students fought for my right. They took over the campus, as happened across many other campuses across the country in 1968, to fight for affirmative action and the right of students of color and poor white youth to enter school. And that's why I'm dedicated to the collective struggle of the people for justice and for socialism. Uh, Ms. Lurie, let me ask you to pass the microphone down to Mr. Little, who will start the next question, the first question which I'll pose now. Um, and I'll, I'll suggest that we hold applause between every candidate and every answer to, to keep moving this along uh, more quickly. And I'll, I won't introduce them each for every answer either. Uh, I'll just say that uh, Bradford Little will, uh, will start this question. Um, this is a two-minute answer, folks. In the wake of uh, the last two weeks' dramatic developments regarding the financial system, Americans are obviously <laughs> concerned not just about the health of the larger economy, but about their own job prospects, their retirements, their ability to obtain a mortgage, affordable housing. So I frame this big economic question as a two-part question. First of all, what do you think specifically of the action taken by Congress last week to, in an attempt to restore stability to the credit markets? Would you like it? Would you support it or oppose it? And then secondly, what's your overall approach to improving the nation's economy in the short run? We'll start with Mr. Lewis. Well, I think the uh, appropriation of that kind of money is extremely important for overcoming the genuine human needs of the American people. Uh, however, to bail out uh, irresponsible financial institutions, mainly in Wall Street, I think is probably a mistake. Um, I think uh, if that kind of money is going to be used by the government, and I think government intervention has to take place in the economy at some point, uh, that it ought to be very carefully given to the people who really need it. Now, uh, for instance, mortgages should be looked at very carefully. I don't think a person who has a swimming pool out in Beverly Hills and his uh, mortgage is foreclosed against that person probably really needs it, can downsize his, uh, his or her uh, accommodations to something more modest. But there are millions of these people in this country who really need housing. They need a house. They need an apartment. They need something to get them off the streets. And the money should go to that, first of all. Then it should go to uh, the whole question of medical care for everyone. It should go to the question of establishing solar power 
our independence from fossil fuels. Uh, billions are needed for this, and we should have crash programs to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, this is the kind of uh, use that I think this kind of money should be uh, put to. Uh, the second part of the question was, well, your, your larger approach to improving the economy in the short run. Well, I guess that sort of uh, summarizes the larger approach, too. I think uh, we have very many, very, very serious needs in this country, and the government has the financial resources. I mean, Warren Buffett stated this, and it's the only entity that has the resources to really provide people with the things that they need. Uh, we've had free market corporate capitalism uh, rampant for a number of decades now, and the result was a disintegration of the system. It collapses. It's basically unstable. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, the problem with the markets recently has been a complete lack of confidence. You know, what disturbs me most about what Congress did is that somebody, you know, Mr. Paulson, who's probably a very intelligent human being on the really over a weekend wrote up and said, well, I need $700 billion. It was a three page memo. Well, I wouldn't, give any, I wouldn't give anybody $70 million on a three-page memo. I wouldn't give anybody $7 million. So this question, you know, what, what are they doing this? And then I'm also very disturbed by the fact that in order, this, all the senators and Congress and uh, congressional people are saying this is the most vote, important vote they've ever had to do. This is the most important thing ever for the country. But yet the Senate, in order to buy the votes to pass this thing, had to add over $100 billion of pork on top of it. Well. If it's that good a bill, why do you need to add a hundred billion dollars in pork? You know, that's that's a lot of money. And so the government needed to do something to reinstall confidence in the markets. They could have done that by basically doing a better marketing job and saying, we're gonna come up with a solution. We're working on it. Not an overall panic to just see how much money they could throw at the problem, which is our problem with most things. How much money we can throw at the problem. To get the economy back on track, Basically, I believe the government needs to get out of the way of the average American. People in America work. People in America make their companies work. People in America succeed when they're allowed to succeed. And giving the government more money and more power to run things, I've heard it said is like giving teenage boys whiskey and car keys. Something bad's gonna happen. And so that's my thing is, we need, they needed to restore confidence, but they should have taken a more measured approach to doing it rather than just throwing all of our money at it. Thank you. We were opposed to the bailout, uh, and then when Congress uh, passed the law recently, uh, we really believed that they should take it uh, beyond of where they stand right now. 80% of AIG is owned by the government, but we would like to see the government nationalize uh, all of the financial service institutions, and we should develop an independent commission or authority uh, that's socially uh, administered and democratically administered by a combination of economists and advocates for the consumer and uh, a reduction of taxes, as well as uh, representation of the common man. And we really think that there should be a radical systemic change in our country. Capitalism has failed America, and uh, it's really based on the profit motive, self-interest, greed, and uh, whereas socialism is a more democratic uh, uh, philosophy, it redistributes the wealth amongst the workers and the citizens who make the decisions in allocating and legislating for the direction of the country. And uh, right now, there's a small elite at the top that makes all the money at the expense of 95% of the Americans. There's a widening gap between the rich and the poor. So uh, this is going to cost the country a, a trillion dollars, and it's not going to solve the problem. The economy will collapse. We don't want it to collapse, but if it does, we believe that the Americans will turn to an alternative radical system in order to survive. And it will be an opportunity for socialism to show the country 
that our system can benefit them in the long run as opposed to this self-serving, uh, selfish system of capitalism. Well, we're opposed to the uh, bailout as well, but uh, we concede that something has to be done to save the credit markets. See, only 97% of money now is created through credit. Credit is money. Only 3% of the currency that you have in your pocket or coins or whatever is actually what's created by the Federal Reserve. The other 97% is created through credit. And without these banks, the credit markets will grind to a halt, as will business. But what I would propose doing would be to take all these failed banks, not just the ones you read about, but all the ones that are failing every day, and put them in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And I've been a bankruptcy lawyer for 30 years, so I recognize it when I see it. Um, put them in Chapter 11 bankruptcy and let the trustee in bankruptcy sort through their assets and separate the real from the imagined. All this derivative paper that you've read about that these banks have invested in, it's why I refer to them as casinos, uh, essentially uh, should be discharged in bankruptcy. The American taxpayer shouldn't accept one penny of risk or obligation for that derivative paper. Then the mortgages could be referred to Fannie and Freddie or sent back to the banks for service, whichever. But in any event, uh, people in distress mortgages, people facing foreclosure, their mortgages could be written down by the bankruptcy system to the value that they actually hold and re so people could stay in their homes. Then Congress could take control of the Federal Reserve Banks, the 12 of them, and take back their constitutional authority over money. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress that authority. Then Congress could act as its own Federal Reserve, in effect issuing credit at will. Uh, without debt and without interest to the American people. Then the backs of uh, this debt-based system that has plagued us and robbed us for 100 years would be broken, and we'd be free again, and we could have a society based on constitutional government and the rule of law. Of course, I'm against the bailout, but in addition, it's important to look at the root causes of the crisis, the financial crisis, the overall capitalist crisis that is deepening every day, um, to find out what the real answers are. First of all, the ones who are responsible, the bankers, of whom are, there are thousands, including the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Board, of the Go Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, they should be indicted. Federal law provides that any lender who knowingly overvalues property or gives a loan knowing that the ability of a borrower to pay is, is not there, they're subject to $1 million fine and 30 years imprisonment. Those laws were not written just to, um, to satisfy us because most people don't know about it, but they should be enforced. And I guarantee if they were enforced, if all those bankers were indicted, you would find a very quick end to the practices that they will continue because there's no oversight. And when you look back at the last 12 years of deregulation from President Clinton, even before that, but Clinton and the Securities Exchange Commission being begged by the five top investment banks, including Goldman Sachs, when one of those executives was the current Treasury Secretary, and in 2004, they effectively lifted the, regu the um, regulations on, on the amount of equity to the debt. This is part of the problem, but the big problem really is overproduction of the capitalist system and the inability of people to pay everything that they need. They're not paid enough in wages. I think that companies like Exxon should have their profits expropriated because they're overcharging people for years now, making profits off the war profits off the monopoly control that they have, and there you would find plenty of money to provide for the needs of people. Thank you. Pass the mic I, I wonder, do I need a mic? Can everybody yeah, you, you, hear you, me? You, you should do it anyway. We're, okay. We're recording in the... Uh, All righty. Yeah. Well, of course, the Boston Tea Party and my campaign opposes uh, any corporate bailouts uh, by the government. Uh, uh, as you would expect, any party who opposes the 
increase in the size, scope, uh, or power of government would. The family fathers never intended for government to have this much power to control industries. And believe me, this is not going to end. It's not going to end there. I mean, you saw, I think it was the day after they passed this, uh, this bill. Didn't Arnold Schwarzenegger come to the government looking for $7 billion uh, to meet a payroll in, in California? The automakers will come. The credit card companies will come. The airlines will come. They have now been enabled. They have now been permissioned to do this. Uh, they're going to get pretty good at it, too. They've had a lot of practice with it uh, lately. Uh, I agree with some of the points that Daryl made, certainly. Uh, and also with Glory, I want to mention that, that you know, in, in this system, and, and, and I don't believe this system is broken. I think that some of the people operating within the system have used it. Uh, but I do believe that this system is, is, is self-correcting in a sense, and that is. And I do agree with you, Brian. A lot of people did uh, 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 you know, abuse uh, uh, or, or do a lot of abusive things within the system. But this system is supposed to reward you for taking risk and penalize you if, if your risks don't work. In other words, capitalism uh, has, uh, includes profit and loss. Now, there's been a lot of talk about congressional oversight uh, with all the discussion of these bills. And I'm here to suggest to you that the most important oversight that you can have is oversight over ourselves. And that means don't buy things you can't afford. Don't go out on a limb. Exercise personal responsibility. If people do not do that, this is going to happen over and over and over and over again. That's where we start to improve the economy and conditions for everybody. And that's how, OK, my time's up. So I'll, um, I thank you for listening. Okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, the next question I'll ask Mr. McAnulty to answer first. Um, and it's, uh, I'll do one more question. This will be a one-minute question about uh, the federal budget, and then we'll move to some international affairs. Uh, uh, several, if most if not all of the candidates here in their opening remarks and in their platforms are interested in changing some of the very, the very nature of government, its role in people's lives. So instead of asking you a, a budget priorities question about you know, how do you feel about defense, education, the environment, health care, what I'd like to do is, is frame it as a, a sort of a broader, more theoretical question, again, a one-minute question here. How big should the federal government be? How big should its budget be? What, what should its role in people's lives be that's different than what it is now from your party's perspective? Well, the federal, federal budget should be a lot smaller than it is today. They've expanded far beyond what they should be involved in, what they should be doing, and they don't need to be involved in those things. I know these, some of these things are going to come up later, but I, I get asked questions all the time. Well, what are you going to do about grade schools as president? Well, quite honestly, grade schools are a state and local issue. The federal government should not be involved in grade schools. And so, you know, how big should the federal budget be? You know, based on what I've seen, for the number of people we have running around Washington and the rest of the country, it should probably be about half of what it is right now. I think the, company, the country would do very well on that budget, and we could adjust to it quite well. The, the federal government has grown far beyond what the Constitution envisioned and what most Americans envision, and it needs to get smaller. Thank you. The federal government will get smaller under socialism. Sometimes people think of socialism as communism or Stalinism with a heavily centralized authoritarian government and a heavy-handed military. But socialism is democratic socialism, where it turns over the power, the authority, the control, and the ownership to the hands of workers and citizens in the community. And it's the workers who decide on whether a product should exist or not, and how much it should be produced, and what services are provided to the community, and what product should be out, outsourced or eliminated, for example, fossil fuels, and maybe we should increase mass transportation. So we will have a smaller government under socialism. It will be, government will be there to serve the workers and the citizens in the community. This will really be a true democracy as opposed to capitalism, which is really a very authoritarian, very, we're, we're leaning toward fascism under capitalism, 
And that's why we really need to have a radical systemic change instead of reform, which most politicians talk about. The uh, federal government should be restricted to its constitutional size. As per the Constitution, it should be restricted to the powers that are enumerated to it in the Constitution and no more. Everything else is reserved to the people or to the states as per the Tenth Amendment. If we did this, it would allow us to do away with the income tax and to restrict government to a constitutional form of taxation, which is tariffs, excises, exposed, and so forth. And uh, it would allow us to uh, keep the fruits of our labor and go on about our private lives as we see fit uh, without this heavy hand of government watching every movement that we make every step you take on videotape, uh, every email you send read by somebody and so forth, all that could go <coughs> away if we just restricted ourselves to the Constitution. Well, it's not a question really of so much of just the size, but which class the government serves. I think that the government should be of, by, and for the people, of course. And regardless of what one's beliefs about too much regulation and so on. I think a government should provide health care for all. I think government should provide free health care for everybody. And instead, what we have is people having to go to one particular job if they have the fortune of having health care or not. But why should people have to struggle and bargain with their boss over whether they will be able to go to a doctor? I think education should be public and provided by the government um, by taxing big business and ultimately a system in where the people have power, where the workers are in power, it would be a government that would make sure to guarantee the things that people need in life. And um, I'm for more government, not less. Because those who, the libertarians, um, really what they know is that capitalism, the power of capitalism rules over the people regardless of government. Well, Daryl's certainly right. Uh, government uh, certainly should be restricted to those uh, those activities that are authorized by the Constitution. But I want I want to add a couple of other things here uh, with, about what government, uh, as as uh, our moderator uh, talked about, the role of government, because uh, I think <laughs> that the government uh, believes that uh, it should be uh, your mommy who's going to take care of you uh, and uh, and listen to you and hear what you need and provide that for you. Or your daddy who's going to punish you and tell you when you've been a bad boy or girl. Uh, we don't need that out of government. Uh, we need uh, to live and let live uh, in this country. And I know politicians don't go along with this. They want power. Uh, they are in the business of politics. And the bigger government gets, the bigger their industry gets. And that is the motivation behind both the Democrat and Republican parties. Uh, taking one measure after another to increase the size of government. That has to stop. All people have certain rights. They have the right to adequate medical care, housing, uh, education, uh, jobs, meaningful jobs. Now, the free market system is sort of experimental. It tries to achieve this to a certain extent indirectly. When it fails, government should step in and provide the things that the free market system has not provided. This means in this country, medical care, housing for everybody, meaningful jobs for everyone. This is the type of activity that government should engage in. The military is not defend, going to defend our country in the sense that most people want it. It's going to lead to nuclear war. It should be abolished. That aspect of our government should completely disappear the nonviolent resistance programs can be largely uh, individual programs and private programs. I think probably the type of society that the fascist party wants would have a smaller government that would be involved in an entirely greatly different way with meeting the needs of the people. Thank you. The next question I'll direct to uh, Mr. Moore, uh, for starters. We'll move to um, foreign policy here. And I don't want to ask these candidates to how what would you do about Iraq and Afghanistan specifically. I'd like I'd like to steer them again more toward their party's philosophical approach. 
Over the last 80 years, a lot of the conversations around foreign policy have been around the distinction between soft power and hard power, uh, the tension between diplomacy and the projection of force. We've just heard some but not all candidates say they want government to do less or be smaller or play a more modest role. The way I'll frame this foreign policy question, and we'll make it a one minute question, I didn't know it probably worked out for so many candidates. I'll frame this question this way. Um, from your party's perspective, when would you project hard power or force, if ever? What, what are the conditions of, of international relations that would lead you to do that as president? Well, I'd hope we would not have to do that, uh, but I want to interject some ideas here. Government should not step in when uh, the private sector fails. It's the workers and the citizens that should step in and take over the control. Government right now is corporate America. The corporations run our country, they own our politicians, they're infiltrated in every federal agency that exists. We have a military economy, a military industrial economy. All 435 congressional districts are inhabited by defense contractors. Our universities get a lot of their monies from research for defense contracts. So we have to change. We have to close down our military bases overseas in this war in Iraq and Afghanistan, get rid of weapons of mass destruction, get rid of the use of nuclear power, both commercially and militarily, reduce the defense industry in half, at least in half, and become an economy and a society based on egalitarianism and fairness and responsibility to our fellow man and not be the bully that we have over the last 200 years. Well, the, I would use uh, military force in defense of the American people and our way of life, in defense of our country. Uh, in a defensive war uh, and in no other, and one that is constitutionally uh, declared. I believe in self-defense and I believe in the defense of the nation. Uh, whether or not the defense budget can be reduced, I believe it can because uh, I don't think we have uh, too small a defense budget. I think we have too large a foreign policy and we should restrict ourselves once again to, uh, to the Constitution and to its dictates and uh, our foreign policy would fall right in line. That is a non-interventionist policy, the one the Founding Fathers gave us. I do not believe that there's any progressive role for the U.S. military abroad. Um, and I think that all U.S. bases and installations, 700 around the world, should be shut down immediately. And all U.S. troops removed from foreign soil. Um, the troops brought back to foreign employment with which there's a great need in this country. Um, the use of demonization in recent years, if you look back at every war, especially post-World War II, the U.S. has had to use a new excuse and pretense every time. And it's time for us to reject the idea of demonizing leaders in order to justify strangulation <coughs> and massacre and killing of people from Iraq to Afghanistan, the blockade of Cuba, I was in Iraq three times. I made a video, an award-winning video, called Genocide by Sanctions, and I saw so many people dying because of the U.S. blockade. That time is still going on today. I have a feeling we're going to have a consensus here. Uh, I am also for non-interventionist uh, policy. National defense is a very important constitutional function, not national offense. We are going down a slippery slope when we look at a country and say, oh, they're developing uh, uh, nuclear weapons, they're developing some other kind of weapon. We have to strike them before they're finished developing that weapon. Uh, that kind of mentality is an enabler for other countries to look at us and say, they have nuclear weapons, we consider them a threat to us. We're going to attack them. We don't want to promote this kind of mentality in this country, and, uh, and, and unfortunately we have. Bring home the troops from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and 130 countries where we have them stationed. Hard military power should never be used particularly in regard to nuclear weapons. Nuclear deterrence, for instance, should be abandoned immediately. 
nuclear weapons should be immediately deactivated by this country. Our entire military approach to international relations should be abandoned. We should base this international program on defense by nonviolent resistance if we fear we're going to be attacked or invaded, and then to use our resources to overcome the effects of poverty worldwide, to help the people of the world rather than be in positions of killing them and destroying their homes and doing terrible damage politically and psychologically to ourselves by these military policies. I believe our armed forces should be used to defend the United States against any and all attacks. I believe Afghanistan was and is a good war. Iraq was and is a bad war. And if we would have not gone into Iraq, we would probably be done with Afghanistan by now. But we, we took our eye off what we were supposed to be doing, what we had a world agreement to take care of in Afghanistan, and dropped the ball by going after Saddam. My website states, I believe in a walk softly and carry a big stick policy. You know, it's not our job to be the policeman of the world. We're not good at it, and it upsets a lot of people. But at the same time, I think we need to work more with the United Nations and the other nations of the world as one of them, as the most powerful or close to the most powerful nation in the world. When something like what happens in Rwanda happens, we need to get the rest of the world and say, hey, we need to go in there and stop that. It's ridiculous that we allow 800,000 people to be killed with machetes when we could get the world behind us and do something to stop it. Thank you. So there's a, um, let me just invite you, by the way, I think the mic and the acoustics work best if you hold it as far away as possible from the edge of the thing. Um, so there, we see here, uh, I guess, a near consensus on a lesser interventionist role in foreign policy. On the previous question, uh, not complete agreement, but, but a lot of comments around the idea of a smaller role for US government. So you put those two together, and that, that leads me to, to my next question. Again, we'll keep it to a minute. Um, so understanding that most, if not all, of you favor this, this lighter or lesser interventionist role with the projection of hard power, what about situations overseas that create humanitarian crises? Are you satisfied with the US's current role overseas in humanitarian situations? Would you increase it, decrease it, keep it the same? And we'll start on this question with Mr. Kessler. Well, I don't see any uh, constitutional provision that allows our government to send our tax dollars over overseas for that reason. Uh, there are uh, many uh, charities around the world. Individually, I guarantee you that Americans, if called upon, would support these causes, but it's not their money to give. Uh, and there's nothing in our constitutional form of government that allows that to happen. And so many times, it causes a lot more problems than it solves. So uh, I would be completely opposed to that, as I am opposed to foreign aid of any kind, economic, military, or any other kind. Well, actually, I think one of the first uh, areas in which to end uh, the foreign aid is to Israel, which is using the money to establish more and more settlements and op oppress the Palestinian people, and against the use of military aid anywhere from Colombia to Turkey to Egypt and elsewhere. I think that the United States has done so much damage and destruction in the world by its wars that it actually owes reparations, whether it's the people of Vietnam who were carpet bombed with millions of gallons of Agent Orange, to the people of Iraq. Iraq was not a country that needed assistance. Iraq was one of the richest countries in the world and has one of the largest resources of oil. It had nationalized oil until now when it's being privatized because of the occupation. It was a country with full employment, full education, free health care, free education through university because it had nationalized oil. And those are the things that people are not aware of, but now it's a country that's devastated and the oil coming into Exxon's and other companies' coffers. Well, the question regarding 
foreign aid? Uh, my answer is uh, absolutely not. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I, I think it's kind of insulting to the taxpayer. I mean, with, you know, this government hits these taxpayers with the full load year after year after year. Uh, if, if you are uh, looking below the surface, you can see all of these wasteful government programs that, that, that you have to carry the load for. And then on top of that, we're going to send billions and billions of dollars overseas. Uh, now, believe me, I feel, I, I feel for those people, but we have enough people in need right here if we're going to direct any of those kind of efforts, and those efforts should be private. There are a lot of great charities run by celebrities, run by non-celebrities, uh, that can work that way. And uh, so, you know, it, 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 my opinion is uh, we have to keep uh, aid uh, out of uh, overseas countries and um, uh, keep a little bit of sovereignty about the issue. It's a small world, and everybody in the modern world is closely related to everybody else. If there is injustice anywhere in the world, it affects everybody else. If there is poverty in the world, it affects everybody else. It is to our national interest to use our economic resources to overcome poverty wherever it is in the world. It is, it is to our national interest to use diplomatic means to try to overcome tyranny and totalitarianism wherever it is in the world. We should have a constant, nonviolent, interventionist policy to create <coughs> enough freedom, dignity for everybody on this planet. Well, I sort of touched on this topic in my last little speech, but I'll expand a little more. When the first, when the Kuwaiti war happened, we led a coalition of, I don't know, close to a hundred different countries in going in there and freeing the Kuwaiti people from Iraq. That's what we should be involved in outside of the United States. It's our responsibility as the most powerful, militarily powerful nation in the world to take a leadership role. That does not mean that we bully people and tell them what they should do, but that means we should lead from the bully pulpit and say, look, this needs to be fixed. Who's with me? And if we can't convince people that our cause or our idea is just, then maybe it's not. And so that's, that's where I feel we need to use our, our power to help the world become a better place. That should be the role of, the, of the, our foreign policy regarding the military. The trouble is the foreign policy of our country has always been based on protecting corporate interests, moneyed interests, oil interests, pharmaceutical interests. Uh, every country just about that we've been in, every other year we get involved in a war. You know, we, 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 we give the nuclear bomb to Pakistan and India and Israel. Uh, we just, uh, you know, go around the world because of the, our self-interest and I think on the, on, the, on the other hand, I believe that we do have an obligation to take care of our fellow man. Socialism is based on uh, uh, communal interest, uh, egalitarian for all, and if there is injustice in other countries, we have a, an obligation to intervene. But I really think that economically we, is where we should be intervening, helping other economies and supporting other economies. Socialism will not succeed in the world unless it is global and not just on a national basis. The next question uh, will be answered first by Ms. Lariva. Uh, a subject that kind of starts to bring us back, back uh, domestically, that bridges foreign and domestic policy, is energy. Um, certainly bemoaning uh, US energy dependence on foreign oil has become a bipartisan spectator sport the first order during the current election cycle, but decrying it and doing something about it are perhaps two different things. Um, if, if there's one thing that the major parties and probably most minor parties and lesser parties agree on, it's, it's that uh, uh, there's a need or a desire for an energy future that's first cleaner and second less dependent on foreign sources. Um, what can the federal government and a president do to actually make this happen? You were president, what would you do bring these goals about, assuming they're goals you agree with. Well, first we declare there is global warming, and that it is caused by, by uh, capitalist 
production of goods to the United States is the best example. It's the, the, the most powerful developed capitalist country in the world and uses more resources per capita. Uh, there needs to be a massive production of and development of mass transit across the country, including bullet train, free transportation in city, and the um, encouragement of bicycles and so on. There needs to be the expropriation of the oil companies. The fact that the oil companies really rule this country, along with the militarists and other big cap um, and the banks, is that they are able to shape all of the energy policy. And now the debate is about being less dependent on foreign oil. We have to be less dependent on oil and for the use of safe alternatives. But if you really think about it, the, look at everything that's produced under capitalism. Everything is a commodity. Everything is made to throw away. And that's the problem. It's too much waste, too much use of the energy's resources. I'll bring it all the way down here, Mr. J. I have a one-minute question, by the way. I just like to say that. I'm going to do all one-minute questions today. I think government needs to stay out of the way. Uh, I think government needs to stop trying to influence uh, the market. <laughs> needs to stop with these humongous subsidies for oil companies. Uh, needs to do what it can to get rid of any restrictive policies that might preclude uh, companies and innovators from developing alternative uh, energy sources. Uh, I'm very encouraged by some of the things that are going on uh, in the private sector. Uh, I, I am optimistic uh, about General Motors and developing a, a vehicle called the Chevy Volt. I know Chrysler's coming in with one. Other automakers will follow. Believe me, you don't have to influence the market for these things. If they work, if they exist, there is going to be plenty of a market for them. That's why when John McCain talks about giving a $300 million government grant, whoever comes up with a battery-powered car, that's chicken feed. It's going to be worth hundreds of times that much uh, for whoever comes to market with it. There is a market, and it will work. Could you repeat the question, please? Well, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, <coughs> probably do that now. <laughs> uh, the question is, is, what specifically can the federal government do to move us toward an energy future that's cleaner and less dependent on foreign sources of energy? If you think those are worthy goals. Next to the threat of the destruction of what we call civilization by nuclear war, there's a possibility of its destruction by global warming. Uh, that issue should be uh, directly addressed by the government through a crash program for solar power, passive and active solar power in all of its forms. The abolition of all forms of fossil fuel burning for transportation or power generation the ex exploration of all forms of other eternal, uh, alternative energy. This should be massive on the order of $700 billion a year, perhaps, <laughs> on a worldwide level, so that energy becomes free for every human being. And that is possible technologically now if we have the will to do it. Oh, I've got about 15 or 20 minutes worth of material on this on my website, so I'll try to keep it real quick. Um, I have a three, first, it's a crime that the, our government does not have a long-term comprehensive energy policy. When you don't have a comprehensive long-term plan, that's how we end up in the shape we are in, because you just bounce from here to there, and you're pushed by the winds of whatever happens. Uh, the first step is continue to develop the renewable resources we have, wind, solar, whatever. Second step is nuclear. I know that's probably not popular with a lot of people in this room, but France and other countries provide almost 80% or more of their electrical energy with nuclear, and it's totally greenhouse gas free. Third, we need a Manhattan-style project to develop the next energy resource. The idea is out there, the idea is there to be developed, we just need a program to pull it together and make it happen. I've been advised that I've been speaking too closely to the mic, so I'll hold it back a little bit. Um, I think that there should be public ownership of power, and there should be more participation with the Q 
Kyoto Treaty by our government, and there should be more oversight of corporations who have been responsible for uh, adversely impacting our natural resources, whether it be water or air or land, and to hold them accountable during the transition phase. We should develop alternative sources of energy and phase out fossil fuels and also phase out nuclear power and any kind of uh, heavy duty uh, weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> Well, energy technology has advanced tremendously in the last few years, but we haven't taken advantage of it for various reasons. But I'm convinced that energy independence for America is possible. It is achievable in a much shorter period of time than what we've been told. Uh, I've investigated it myself as carefully as I could, but I, in order to do it, uh, we would have to exploit all areas of energy at the same time. Alternative, certainly, uh, but uh, coal, oil shell, coal gas, uh, clean technology, all of this can be done with environmentally clean and safe uh, measures now, as it should be. But the measures uh, and the regulations should only be there to protect the environment, not for anyone's political views. Uh, as uh, the gentleman just pointed out a few minutes ago, France derives 78% of its uh, electricity from nuclear, and it's all new technology and all uh, relatively clean and safe now. Yeah, pass that microphone back to Mr. Jay. He'll take the next question. Thank you. Economists and others um, like to talk about the fact that, um, that there are serious challenges ahead uh, with, with the way our federal government is currently configured, especially with respect to what we, what we describe uh, generally as federal entitlement programs, things like Social Security in particular and Medicare. Um, I guess the, 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 the policy wonk question would be to ask, what would you do to manage the future of these programs or fix it? Um, and, you're, and you're sort of welcome to address that in this one minute question. But, but I'd like to pose it also more broadly and theoretically, which is, what about the social contracts that these programs represent that have been in place for decades? Do you favor continuing these social contracts represented by entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security? And if so, how would you fix what many see as a looming problem because of the demographics? A lot of these entitlement programs entail involuntary contributions, so to speak, uh, from people. And I believe that um, certainly when it comes to Social Security, I would rather give the option, especially to, to, to the, the, the younger workforce, uh, to put that kind of a thing in a private account. Uh, you, I, if you're younger, you're never going to see the kind of benefits uh, that, that, that will equal what you're putting into the system. And so I know that there was one libertarian candidate for president uh, years ago who, who proposed that uh, perhaps there could be a cutoff date by which uh, that you would guarantee that you would eliminate the income tax and uh, let people uh, uh, or, or allow people not, not to put money into uh, Social Security anymore and just leave it there. And um, I, I believe in the privatization of these kinds of things that provide for health care and, uh, and retirement uh, programs. I don't think it should be done, and it should be financed through force. Entitlement programs state the moral reality of the situation. Every human being born on this planet is entitled to this kind of economic security. Uh, the question is, how do you pay for it? Well, we find difficulty paying for it in this country because we put such enormous amounts of money into the military, $700 billion a year. Now, if we took that money and put it into Social Security, medical care, all of these things that people absolutely need, there wouldn't be any problem financing it. That's what we should be doing. <laughs> Entitlement programs are what the federal government should be involved in, but in my view, not to the extent they are. <coughs> Entitlement programs should be a safety net. People need to be more responsible and realize that they have to be more responsible for things that happen to them in their lives. And, that's, and then if something really bad happens, you have the safety net of the federal government. 
Unfortunately, our entitlement programs, such as Social Security, they want people to believe that that's their retirement. It was never established as that. It was never planned to be that. But people go with the idea that they're going to live off their Social Security. Whether you believe it's going to be there or not when you're time to retire, it's, it's not enough for people to truly live on. They need to do their own savings and take care of themselves, the personal responsibility. Same with Medicare. You need to take care of yourself. You need to work towards having, taking care of your health so that you're not old and crippled when you get there. Entitlement should be a safety net. Thank you. People can be more responsible if they are given more authority and more control of their lives. So if we give economic rights to our fellow citizens, like full employment, full housing, full health care, then they will treat them responsibly. And if we eliminate the for-profit sector, then there's, we can redistribute the monies that are existing in our, in our world in a more equitable way. The money is there, it's just how it's distributed. Right now, 5% of the people hold about 75% of the wealth, and they inherit the power. And that's the, that's the crime. We can get rid of Social Security and welfare and all those when we have guaranteed incomes for senior citizens and for the handicapped. And we can have full employment for our citizens, and they can be assured a quality of life. And that is what's expected under socialism and can be achieved if we treat and use our dollars wisely and responsibly and fairly. <clears throat> Programs that uh, involve a contract between the American people and the government, like Social Security, that people have paid into their entire lives, uh, have to be met. Uh, those contracts cannot simply be broken by the government arbitrarily. Uh, but uh, there is a day of reckoning coming, and uh, there is a, a cutoff point where people are going to have to be uh, allowed to manage their own retirement. Uh, and I would suggest some system where uh, the money that's been paid in already uh, is uh, people can continue receiving, and uh, then at some point uh, it can turn be turned over to individual people for private investment. Uh, in general, uh, the government should restrict itself to its constitutional size, but there are some people who are so dependent that uh, those programs are simply going to have to be continued until a sound money system is in place and our uh, currency doesn't continue to fall in value. Well, I think capitalism went through the strengthening of all the entitlement programs, but there's so little information. People are so misinformed, especially with hundreds of TV channels that divert our attention from what's really going on. The fact is that Social Security is being raided by the government to pay military debts. Uh, the money that people put in is being used for other expenses of the government. And the limit on the rich, they don't have to pay for, this, for Social Security. There should be no limit on the incomes that have to be taxed for Social Security. Then there would be a much bigger fund. The entitlements of the 1930s, whether the housing, the welfare, unemployment, everything in entitlements came out by the people's struggle. And we're going to have to have a massive people's movement in this country to win back the things that we need. Lastly, medical care is exorbitant because of profits. It has to be taken out of the hands of the pharmaceuticals and insurance companies. And of course, as Brian Moore says, I agree with him very much that it is socialism that can provide for everyone's needs. Thank you. The next question, uh, Mr. Little, will be the one to respond first. And I, I think I have time for two more questions. And, and what I'd like to do with this next question is a sort of a, a kind of an odd freeform question. Um, I, I've come armed with a bunch of issues that we could uh, uh, group under the rubric of civil liberties. Um, everything from the balance between uh, national security and civil liberties, telecommunications, surveillance, Patriot Act, that sort of thing. But also the kinds of civil liberties issues that grow straight out of the Bill of Rights, um, 
uh, such things as racial justice, uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation, same-sex marriage, abortion, uh, immigration, uh, incarceration. It's, it's quite a stew. Um, and so what I'd like to do is invite each of you not to address all of these issues in one minute, in one although minute. if you can do that, I'll <laughs> do that perhaps. But instead, because, because you do come at these topics with different points of emphasis, rather than a, a one-size-fits-all question, invite you to talk for a minute about the civil liberties issues that actually interest you most and your candidacy and your party most. Let's start with Mr. Lewis. Civil liberties, uh, freedom of speech, First Amendment rights should be universal and never infringed upon. Uh, if you had sufficient financial resources to, uh, say, provide medical care, housing, education for all immigrants, there would be no political question about it. But it's when you're spending 600 billion, 700 billion for the military, there's a big argument. Many of these questions would simply go away if we had a proper uh, allocation of resources to give people decent ways of life. It would also uh, lessen a great deal of the violence and crime in this country if there weren't these great degrees of poverty. Uh, I think that this is the basic uh, approach that we would take. Take a, a simple situation now, say this airport security. This is one thing that I believe in because there are people around who I think would plant bombs on planes, but apart from that, this whole uh, program of, of hunting for spies and trying <coughs> to keep terrorists from killing us is, I think, quite unrealistic. One hydrogen bomb and a small pleasure boat in New York City is gone. This is the kind of world we live in. You create security by creating a world in which people are friendlier to each other. I'm trying to remember the whole question. But ba basically, you know, to answer what I think a lot of other questions could be answered, asked tonight was, all people should be, cre should be treated equally in all things. There's just, there's no reason for there to be different rules for different groups or types of people, period. People are people, end of story. You know, the security, our rights and aspects, you know, the, the Patriot Act, I believe was another one of these things, a far reaching act. You know, sort of like our $700 billion recently, that was passed in way too much panic that had way too much, gave way too much control over our lives to people that were all of a sudden made up into made up positions. It, it bothers me. I think the Patriot Act really needs to be looked at and scaled way back. It's true, there's a lot of people out there wanting to kill us, but maybe we should look at the reasons why they think that they need to try to kill us and deal with those first. Thank you. I would agree with that last point, that if we get to the root cause of this threat to our safety and security, we'll find out that it's our economic policies and foreign policies and many, and our, and our corporate policies that have created this hatred and this anger and this revenge and this jealousy and this whatever else uh, exists in the world. And these are the threats. And if we can eliminate that, then we can eliminate the dangers to our society. To me, the greatest threat to America is the loss of liberties. Greater than the threat of the, uh, this so-called war on terrorism. I really don't even think we should have gone to have had a war on terrorism. It was a criminal act. The Trade Center attack was a criminal act, just like the Lockerbie incident, and we should have gone after those, those individuals that were responsible. But no, we declared a war on, on a civilization and on a society. We're losing habeas corpus. We're torturing people. We're, we're sending people around the world just to do things that are unfair and unjust and un-American. So civil liberties are the greatest need for our country, and we need to preserve them and protect them at all costs. To, uh, to protect civil liberties is the reason governments are instituted uh, according to the Declaration of Independence, and it is the first order of business for the government. The Patriot Act, one, two, and three, the Military Commissions Act, and all such related uh, acts should be withdrawn immediately. Bravo. Maybe the Congress is a constitutional right. Anyone who can read can see that. 
uh, and it should be respected as it has been for over a thousand years until we got this administration. Uh, and to carry this one step further, I'm convinced that there are many people uh, trapped in our uh, civil justice system, locked in prison, who committed no crimes right. against anyone other than themselves. And so certain uh, low-level possessory drug offenses uh, should be decriminalized, or we should at least look at going that way. I'm for the elimination of many of the repressive laws that have been passed, including the elimination of the <coughs> corpus for, that was embodied in the effective death penalty and anti-terrorism law that Clinton passed in 1996. That must be abolished. I'm for the abolition of the death penalty. I'm for um, rights for prisoners that are being so abused, whether it's the two million across this country, and the right to rehabilitation, the right to a job after they get out of prison. It's one of the biggest problems that we face is the huge cost of imprisonment and warehousing of the poor. I'm for full rights of the immigrant, undocumented. The 12 million who are undocumented, the 17 million who are permanent residents, uh, five million ex-prisoners and prisoners who are denied the right to vote. That's 32 million people in this country who have no voice in the political process. There are many, many things that we have to do to win rights for all. But on the issue of immigration, as long as one huge sector of the working class is oppressed, then we cannot hope to win uh, improvement in the lives of all people. And one more thing, I'm for affirmative action and enforcing it with quotas so that there's justice for African American, Latino, and other people of color in jobs and education. Well, you know, Professor Barry, I was going to take a stand at all those issues in, in one minute. If I, if I could talk like the guy from the old Federal Express commercial, I would definitely be able to pull it off. Uh, I want to talk about something that's maybe not the most passionate issue, but one that I think I might come in with a little bit of a different point of view than most candidates would, and that is on the issue of same-sex marriage, because uh, that uh, that uh, subject comes up a lot in the, in the debates and discussions and forums that I engage in, and uh, and I've come around to a different uh, point of view on it, and that is that uh, I believe government should get completely and totally out of the marriage. <laughs> it is unnatural for a relationship of love and trust between two consenting individuals to be a subject of government sanction or approval. The idea that government could license marriage implies that government could deny a license to a marriage. Government needs to get completely out of it there need to be civil agreements or civil contracts, what have you. Disputes can be adjudicated in civil court. <coughs> Government needs to stay out of the marriage business. Thank you. I'm going to uh, pose one more question before we go to closing statements. And this last question, Mr. Uh, McAnulty will, will answer first. Um, and in a, in a way, this, is, this could be the most important question um, for uh, a forum like this. And I wanted to make sure we didn't get out of here without addressing it. In a forum like this with contenders who are <coughs> independent of the major parties that dominate our system, I think it's really crucial to give them a chance to talk about the U.S. political context within which these alternative parties and, the, and their candidacies exist. So the question I put to you is this. What is it about our system, as it's presently uh, construed and, and, and implemented, that makes it so difficult for alternative parties outside the big two to have a significant voice in our democracy and in our public policy. And what specific changes, if you could wave a wand, what changes to our laws, our election laws, our campaign laws, and so forth, would you advocate to improve the landscape for candidacies like yours? Yeah, give them a minute or so, but just think <laughs> a little bit of time. <laughs> it's world changing questions in a minute. The, um, the, part, the reason it's so difficult for third party candidates and the two-party system has just a stranglehold on our politics is because, quite honestly, people have allowed it to happen. We've allowed the special interests to come in and take control. We've allowed them to continue to buy us off, quite honestly. You know, you got, it doesn't matter what group you belong to, what you do for a living, what you think, 
there's a group out there that lobbies Congress to get things to go your way. And that's what's wrong. We've, uh, we've allowed ourselves to become a nation of, I need the government to do what's best for me, rather than I need the government to do what's best for the country and for all Americans, because if things are improved for everybody, then my life will be improved as well. Rather than saying, you need to pass this tax loss for my business can make more money or write something off that no one else can. No, you need to keep taxes in that where they're fair for everybody and that'll be fair, that'll make everybody's life better. The two major parties are responsible for what is going on in our country today and beforehand. We've had a widening gap of the rich and the poor, and the poor are not just the lower class or the bottom 20%, it's the bottom 90%, all right? Capitalism is not democratic, okay? Corporate power has ruled in this country, and socialists actually do not believe that we can change the system electorally. We would like to have campaign finance laws and universal access to states on the ballots and so forth, but we still recognize the power of the dollar, the power of corporations and the interest groups, and it's just so difficult that I think ultimately we're going to end up with water wars and f fuel wars and feud f food wars, and this economy is going to go down the drain and collapse, and it's just going to be chaos. And the universities and the think tanks and the Congress have failed this nation by considering, not considering alternative economies. And they are to be held accountable as well. So it's, uh, it's a system that's not working, but it's so powerful it's difficult to overcome. But the workers and the citizens will ultimately have to be the ones to do it. It's difficult for third parties to gain traction in our political process, really, for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that Democrats and Republicans control ballot access in every state. And in many states, it's virtually impossible to get ballot access, no matter what you do. Uh, there are two states that don't even allow write-in uh, uh, votes, no matter what you do. So uh, it's difficult in that regard. All of this can be overcome if you have millions of dollars to spend paying professional uh, petition gatherers. Uh, so that's one problem. A uh, second problem is uh, we, we live in a society that has a controlled media that's concentrated in the hands of only four or five gigantic corporations which are run by only four or five people. And uh, uh, those, uh, that is a major problem for people getting access. Uh, and um, uh, if uh, that were not the case, then alternative views could be heard people could raise money for their campaigns and they could get ballot access, but anyone, any candidate who has ballot access in enough states to theoretically win the election should be allowed access to the debates. Well, there's a great deal to be said about electoral reform and, and others have raised some of those ideas of access to the media when you reach ballot status and making it easier to have ballot status. You know, I've been involved in many of those struggles myself and our party as well. But I think there's a much greater, greater question about the issue of democracy. What democracy is it when people voted in the majority Democrats in 2006 and then continued to finance a war along with the Republicans when everyone knows they were elected on the basis of an anti-war position, supposedly? What democracy is it when the lobbyists are in their offices of Congress and write the laws for them and get them passed to benefit big business? The fact that a $700 billion bailout was passed, and yet the same week, a seven-week extension for the people of this country who receive unemployment, not even people who are unemployed, but those who get benefits, could not manage to pass both houses, nor that of President Bush shows that those who have the power, the capitalists, make the political decisions. And what we need is a mass movement, civil rights for African Americans, the end of the Vietnam War, LGBT rights, women's rights, everything we've ever gained in this country came from the people fighting. And the fact that millions flooded Congress with phone calls against the bailout showed a little bit of what we can do. We need much more in this country. 
I, I don't know if I forgot the question or not. I think this has something to do with third parties and the struggle of third parties. What makes it difficult and what specific okay. changes to laws? Uh, uh, we we kind of went off on tangents there. I, you know, I, I don't get that caught up in the, the idea that the, we are entitled to uh, the same media coverage or the same access to the debates or anything like that. Um, but uh, you're not going to ask uh, in questionnaires and in interviews, uh, do you think that third parties should have equal ballot access to the two major parties? And I, I tell the interviewer, don't play semantics there. Don't use the word equal ballot access, because what will happen is Republicans and Democrats will say, yeah, okay, in the state of California, you got to get you know, two million signatures or whatever. Knowing they can get it, the third parties can't. We need easier ballot access. We need easier access to the ballots and be able to run. One of the most beautiful things uh, that's, that, that's come around and that, that's, that's you know, since 2000 and 2004 when I ran last is the internet. That is a great democratizing force. And we learn to use that better we are going to go further and further in terms of leveling the playing field. And we're going to make third parties, who are the politics of the 21st century, more and more of a factor in America. This is a very serious question. The uh, electoral system is run by the major parties, and it's set up for them. And it's set up to exclude third parties. The basic consequence of this is that ideas which are necessary for the development and existence of our society are suppressed, and people do not hear them, they cannot think about them, they cannot evaluate them. To me, one of the, the, the greatest myth that the establishment projects is that military systems can give us security, and that is a scientific falsehood. Uh, ballot access should be equal for all people. Funding should be equal for all parties. Proportional representation should exist so that you, you can hold a position in Congress or the Senate even though you, uh, it's not winner take all. If it, it, this is the, these are the kinds of reforms which we need simply to get ideas into our society which are necessary for its improvement and existence. At this time, I, uh, at this time, I invite each candidate uh, to make a closing remarks of a minute. Um, we'll start with Ms. Lariva. She'll pass the microphone that way, and we'll just move down the line towards me. I'd like to uh, talk about the economic crisis right now, and uh, I think that most people believe, despite the promises of the government and Bush that the crisis is going to deepen. There was a Deutsche Bank internal memorandum that was leaked to the public, to the media, that indicates that 40% of homeowners in the United States in the next 12 to 18 months will have to pay mortgages that um, and on a value higher than, than the value of their house. There's going to be a gigantic crisis deepening on the question of the mortgages. Um, the uh, household net worth in this country has dropped by six trillion dollars in the last year and one trillion in the last four weeks. You read everywhere about the economic crisis, but sisters and brothers, we are swimming in a sea of tremendous wealth and abundance. There's overabundance of food, of housing, of everything that people need. There is plenty for everybody and plenty for other people in the world for us to share. The problem is the system. Maybe you may not agree of the need for socialism. I am a fighter for socialism. My party, for, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, is very active in every struggle across this country. We will fight to keep our voices heard. But beyond November 4th, beyond January 20th, and the inauguration of the next president, it is clear that the people will have to fight for our rights and fight for justice, economic and social. So I welcome you to check our website, pslweb.org. Take a look at us, read our material, read our literature in the future. I'm sure that you will find many more, more and more millions of people in this country will find um, our ideas um, aligned with theirs. Thank you very much. Well, in closing, uh, let me just remind you that uh, 
you may not like this bailout that was just passed. Uh, and if you don't, every single congressman who voted in favor of it is up for re-election. <laughs> you can vote them out of office. That, that's what you should do. That, this is a constitutional <laughs> report. Uh, as far as uh, home mortgages and things of that nature, uh, I'll tell you that uh, if the government would just simply return to the Constitution and adopt the system that I just told you about, those problems would be resolved very quickly. People could stay in their homes uh, at their actual value, not the value that they were uh, originally purchased at. The, the home market is just finding its real value right now. The same thing's happening to the stock market. This bubble that was created is deflating and the market's just returning to the mean, that's all. So, uh, you know, in closing, once again, I'll just tell you that uh, we should return to constitutional government and the rule of law, and most of our problems would be resolved. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you this evening, and to the students and organizations who are responsible for organizing this. Uh, I would like to agree with Mr. Castle, but I can't. I don't think that if you don't agree with the, the congressman who voted for the bailout, vote him out of office, because I think the power of money is too strong in this country and that they get it from the corporate and special interests. But I've been pretty negative all night and very critical, and I'm sure some of you may resent my approach. But let me do a little positiveness here. Socialism has a rich heritage in this country. 105 years ago, they advocated child labor laws and women's suffrage and a 40-hour work week and unemployment insurance and workers' compensation and collective bargaining and on and on and on. And there were people like Sinclair Lewis and Joseph Conrad and Einstein and Helen Keller and people like that that were avid socialists. But then we got the, the nasty image from the Cold War and the McCarthyism and uh, things of that nature, and Stalinism. But we do advocate change, and as uh, Eugene Deb said, socialism has a power of its own. It doesn't need a charismatic leader or a great number of people in the party. It has a strength and a vigor and a power, and it will emerge. And capitalism will fail. It will fail miserably, and it's just a matter of time and letting it happen. I also want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and especially the people that put this event on. If we had groups like this putting on more of these events around the country, I believe we could start to make a much bigger impression on the election and the election cycle. I also, I'm also very pleased whenever I come to these things. I've, I've debated Brian before and, and Charles and quite a few other candidates, and it's amazing, even of the six people up here, you'd think we have absolutely nothing in common. But you know, even with Gloria, I believe that there should be a lot of people going to prison over this mortgage mess. It's ridiculous. There was massive fraud. And it's just <laughs> so I, I agreed with Brian on things before when we had our two-hour debate. And <laughs> disagreed on a lot of things too, but that's that's normal. But that's what makes me feel good about that there is a chance to make the make a change because we all want the same thing. We want a better America for all Americans. We don't want, to, I don't think anybody up here wants a, uh, to create an elite class or something like that. So that, that's the good thing to come out of this, is that we, we have differences, but we can agree on things. And so I'd just like to ask you to please visit my website at frankforpresident.org. I have flyers out front, and thank you. I too would like to thank all of the organizers of this event. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the panelists, all of them. I, although I haven't agreed with all of them, I found them very stimulating. They forced me to think. I see that all of them are very thoughtful about their own positions, and this has been excellent. Uh, the pacifist party, as you know by now, is against military force, power, and I urge you to study that equation that's described over there, because that describes what is going to happen to our society 
if we continue to try to base its security on military violence. The basic problem of our world is how to solve conflicts of all kinds without using violence. If you can do that, you can achieve social justice, you can achieve economic justice, you can achieve international peace. If you continually resort to violence, mass violence, you can't solve any of these problems. Uh, what we're talking about here are questions of social and economic justice and world peace. These are the most difficult problems facing the human species. They require the best intelligence, the most passionate commitment that you have to solve these problems. They are solvable. Don't let anybody tell you that we're always going to have to have war or poverty. We don't. But these problems are going to be overcome only when people, particularly the up and coming generation, invests their energy in trying to overcome them thinking about them, working on them, dedicating themselves to these goals. Uh, I have no background in politics. When I ran originally in, in 2004, I literally <coughs> came off the street to do it. I mean, uh, I, I was, but I was concerned. Um, and friends and family and people along the way kept uh, wondering, you know, why I was doing it. You know, I was wondering at times why I was doing it. Uh, but along the way, you pick up reasons and you pick up justification. And at the end of it, um, I was invited to speak at the University of Akron in Ohio. And um, as I'm talking to a political science class, I mean, maybe one of the most important things hit me right in the middle of it. And one of the most important things and reasons for running is to encourage young people to get involved in this thing. It is so important. It will make you a better person. It will make you a better American. Believe me. Why are you running? You can't win. People that ask that question don't get it. See this? We are winning. You see? You're here. You've opened yourself up to all of this. You're winning too. America is winning because we're here tonight. Yes, thank you to the organizers, thank you to Professor Barry, thank you to the crowd that came out. CJ08.com, please grab a flyer, please grab a button, they're very cool looking buttons. Uh, <laughs> business card, don't, please don't make me lug all these home with me. And by the way, go Commodores. Good night, everybody. <laughs>